what we're all looking forward to. Our other sponsor was uh, Michelle from the Chamber of Commerce. Really helped us out a lot. I want to give just a minute over here to another big sponsor that helped us uh, with this too, was uh, Shadow uh, Vineyard and Winery. Uh, Doug, would you like to tell us a little bit about it? I'm Doug Mankman from here with George Parsons. Shadow Vineyard and Winery. We're located four miles north of Carson. There's some cards here with numbers and websites if you want to look us up. That'd be great. We were invited here by Chuck to work with the wine pairings, which is kind of exciting. I think wine pairings, one of those things that makes enjoying wine more fun. There is, it can be an extremely strict science to wine pairing, where you can enjoy it with a casual look. You can go on the web and see 10 different pages on what to match with what to. There are wine rules and parentheses that people always talk about, but as we always say, no matter what the rules are, personal preference goes above any wine rule. If you like it, it's right. So have another wine, try it, and see what you think. With the New Yorker, we're going to be using, uh, having a Riesling and Chamberson to try. It's off dry, so but we just assume it goes good with the saltiness, the cheese in there, so we hope that goes well. Thank you. here by PLCB, so all the rules apply of age. You have to be 21 or older, so if you get asked by any service, please take us a compliment and have some ideas. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, without further ado, we want to give an official Punxsutawney welcome to our guest uh, speaker, Chef Tony Gemignani, and to do that, we're going to invite up uh, Mayor Rich Alexander, please. Another special guest, Phil, and two members of the Brown Hawk Club. Uh, Phil D. is president. And Bob Roberts, the protector. Let's give them a hand. you to meet our most famous uh, resident here, Punxsutawney, Punxsutawney Phil. Uh, he does bites, I wear gloves, you're not. Uh, we, don't, we don't want blood to bites uh, here, we want uh, pepperoni pizza. Okay. Just, just don't get him too close to bite the <laughs> Also, too, I see today we're being sued by New Hampshire for, uh, they're getting too much snow up there. So, uh, we'll bring on all your frost or whatever. <laughs> also, too, uh, Phil, Phil does ap apologize. He was just sleeping. Uh, didn't comb his hair too well here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the a few words and, and uh, compliment Tony on his, a few of his accomplishments. He, he is known as a renaissance man of pizza. He was 11 time pizza champion and he's the author of the Pizza Bible. Congratulations on all those honors, Thank Tony. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. So without further ado, I'll give it back to Scott. And thanks everyone for coming. There are a lot of pizza lovers in the audience. <laughs>
speak loudly so everyone can hear your questions. All right, guys. I'm going to actually talk. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. How's everybody? Yeah. Who likes pizza? Yeah. Who loves pizza? <laughs> I started 23 years ago. Uh, my brother had the idea of opening a pizzeria. It was Paisano's in Castro Valley. I grew up in Fremont, California, um, about 20 minutes from Castro Valley. We had 35 acres. Uh, my grandpa was a big Italian farmer. We uh, did cherries, apricots, and fava beans. Um, I did that every year. I farmed every year. Uh, we lived with our grandpa, uh, my parents and I, and my brother, we all lived with our grandpa. So growing up around uh, fresh ingredients, uh, we had it in the backyard. I mean, if we needed basil, we needed tomatoes, we needed corn, oranges, tangerillos, I mean, you name it, we kind of had it in, the, in our backyard somewhere. You know, we had squash, zucchini, and everything. And watching my mom cook uh, growing up was a big part of our, our life. You know, come home from school at three, watch my mom cook until about six when my dad came home from work, and we all ate together uh, at the table. So it was a very family, very traditional uh, household that I grew up in. And I was really fortunate because I kind of watched my grandpa, his work ethics, uh, you know, farming, was, which I always say he was the hardest working man I ever knew. Um, watching my grandpa get up before the sun was up and come back when the sun was just kind of coming down was just, he didn't take a break. He just sat in his shack and uh, ate some sardines and had crackers and then went back out to work. And I worked with him a lot when we were, when we were younger. So I learned a lot about farming, um, at least that type of farming. My brother taught me the basics on pizza. You know, here it was with this dough in front of me. You know, we had pizza when I was young, but I never really made it for real. I tossed it up in the air. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Got pretty good at it. We were doing tricks with it. We did so much oh. that, <laughs> that uh, I, don't know, I got really good at it. Started doing tricks when kids came into the restaurant. <laughs> I mean, I got pretty good. What a halo, that's a good one. Oh, that Made little hats for kids. For kids. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> you can keep that one for me, okay? <laughs> you got the big one. <laughs> and uh, I got pretty good. I started entering competitions. I won a bunch of titles in acrobatics, and I started touring the world throwing pizzas. And when I toured, the world throwing pizzas, I went to Italy, went to Germany, went to Thailand, went to London, went to Belgium, went all over the U.S. Um, of course, regional pizzas in Italy, Sicily, and I was fortunate enough to see how pizza was made in New York or Connecticut or from Fargo to Florida. So I ended up learning a lot while I was on the road and down the line in my career, um, I ended up competing in cooking competitions. And I got pretty good at that. I won a number of different competitions in, in the uh, cooking world from Naples all the way to winning on the Food Network. Uh, we're making a pizza today that is uh, from the Food Network. It's a Calitalia pizza that won for best pizza in the US. I'm gonna make that for you today. I'm gonna show you a pizza called the New Yorker, a traditional pizza that's um, simple but still complex. Who makes dough at home? Who makes dough? And do we have um, any, most of us have home ovens, 500 degrees, 520. So you can make great pizza in a home oven. A lot of people think you can. A lot of people say, what am I doing wrong? Why can't I make it like the guys in the pizzerias? And it's not usually that you're doing something wrong. It's typically that you know, you're not using the right ingredients. And when it comes to the right ingredients, in the pizza industry, we don't use typically all-purpose flour that you grab off the shelf in your um, grocery store. We use high gluten, high protein flours. We use browning agents if we cook at 500 to 600, meaning that I'm putting sugar in my dough if it cooks at 500, 550. I put malts, I put honey, I put molasses. Cooking at 500 to 550 to 600, we like a browning agent. A lot of recipes that you do at home don't call for that one ingredient. It's important when it comes to the end of, to cooking at home is, is really having that browning agent. Take one of those for me, you guys. One of those pies. One is unfinished. I'm going to show them how to finish it. So we use a specific flour, high gluten, high protein flour. It's important. 
We use pizza flowers. I have three books that I've written. The first book I wrote was called Pizza. The second book was a children's book. And the third book was the Pizza Bible. When I wrote Pizza back in 04, the internet wasn't that big. I couldn't find that San Marzano tomato that you heard about from Naples. Uh, I couldn't really go Google it. And I couldn't Google a, a malt or a starter or whatever. It was what was in the grocery store and what you could find, and that was the best thing. So now, 10 years later, 11 years later, <coughs> you know, everything's changed. You know, I, I can list references in a book, which I do, and in that book, there's lots of professional references. And references are so important when it comes to specifics, and we use specific ingredients. I talk a lot about starters in this book, and anyone, anyone know what a starter means in a dough recipe? It's fermented dough. Let's just say I had some water, flour, a little bit of yeast, and I let it ferment for 15 hours. I use this stinky, smelly mass that I smell in, in, in 15 hours or 18 hours, and I put it in my dough to make it more complex, more flavorful more aromatic. So you're going to see a lot in this book starters that go in dough because really the pizzeria tomorrow, the pizzeria, like if you look at the top 20 pizzerias in the U.S., I would say 18 out of 20 of them use starters in their dough. And that goes down the bread route. Bakers, what bakers do in bakeries to make ciabatta or baguettes, that's really what's kind of gone into the pizza industry. There's styles that you may have never heard of, could hear, maybe Detroit style. I'm sure everyone's heard of New York. Chicago, St. Louis style, you know, Pizza Romana, Sicilian style, Long Island grandma style. When you look at Italy and you look at the U.S., Italy is very regional and so is the U.S. And as you go from east to west, you really see how pizza changed all over the U.S. And usually that's local ingredients, specific cheese like Prevel from St. Louis, a brick cheese they may use you know, in a uh, Detroit style pizza that kind of comes from the Wisconsin area. A multi-grain dough, a multi-grain dough that would come into California because California is very progressive. So you see in this book, it's a book that's really, I don't think, really been tapped into the subcultures of this industry. It's all about specific styles and what's unique about pizza. You know, a lot about pizza is like, you know, on the outside, but a lot of it's also what's, what's on the inside. You know, I can teach anyone how to make a great pizza, but it's really up to them to really um, make it how they want to make it. Is that dough at all yet? Yeah? Apparently not. No? Okay. I'm going to try and teach you something with some acrobatic dough. Um, so when we open up a pizza, we want to open up pizza with our hands. Still is a little tight because it's kind of more meant for tossing. I think the students are trying to trick me and not help me. <laughs> gave me these fake dough. Of course Scott's doing it. And when you open a pizza up, you want to be gentle on it. I mean, you saw me toss a pizza. And when you spin it, it looks like I'm in the middle a lot. But I'm not. I'm always on the ends. Staying away from my middle, making it not making it weak. So the pizza that we're passing out right now is the New Yorker. So you guys are going to start trying this pizza. It's a pizza. If you guys go to, does anyone know what the page on the book is of the New Yorker? Somebody want to find it for me? Because we want to see if the students got it exactly like the picture in the book. Ah. One minute, I'm going to get some uh, <laughs> real dough. Okay, so I'm going to stretch out this pizza. You're going to see that this pizza is going to stretch out a lot easier than the dough I just did. So when I'm stretching out, I'm kind of gradual and soft on this pizza. Even like this, a Neapolitan slap is I'm only pushing it down and stretching it out if I go in slow motion. So we want to stay around the edges when we're stretching out a pizza. We want to stay away from the middle. But like when you're making a meatball, 
You don't make a meatball and press it in and smash this meatball and mash it. When you make a meatball, you're gradually getting this meatball together in a ball and like this. Why do we do that to a meatball? Because we want it to be nice and tender. So pretend that when you're making meatballs, it's like when you're making dough is when you're pushing out dough, we want to leave the gas in it. We want to leave it nice and tender. We want to make it soft. The softer we are on a pizza, the softer and lighter it will be when you eat it. So this is like the upside down pizza. We have sliced mozzarella on the bottom. This is 100% whole milk mozzarella. I'm gonna layer this on. And don't worry, you guys over here, I'm gonna actually make a pizza over there. If you guys can't see, anybody in the audience, you might be able to see. I'm gonna make the calatai over there so you don't feel left out. So we're gonna add our sliced mozzarella. I dusted my dough in some semolina. Why am I dusting my dough in semolina? Makes your pizza stronger. Typically you have three things you could dust your dough in, flour, semolina, or cornmeal. Semolina will make a pizza much stronger, but definitely better for to go. But if you want a pizza that's similar to like a New York slice, you want to kind of do a combination of a little bit of flour and a lot of semolina. So the sauce, the upside down pizza, we have our layered mozzarella on the bottom. We're gonna go ahead and add some dollops of sauce over the top. If you ever hear of the places like Lombardi's, maybe Grimaldi's, Batono's, you'll see a lot of pizzas like this, even in New Haven, where you have sliced mozzarella on the bottom, and you have your cheese, uh, sliced mozzarella on the bottom, and your sauce on the top. So, we have a few layers. You have some pepperoni. This is a natural case pepperoni. It looks like a tiny little guy. This is the most expensive pe uh, pepperoni to buy in the industry. It's a natural case of cups. It's small, but it's an old way of making pepperoni. Um, I talk a lot about this because a lot of old school pizzerias use natural case pepperoni. Not necessarily the big pepperonis are better. It's actually typically the big pepperonis are cheaper. We have a few different sausages. When I when I make mine and the, and the students cut uh, cook these a little bit in the back. When I use raw sausage, I like to pinch it the size of a dime, and I like to make it flat. And I like to cook my raw sausage on my pizza. I mean, all the flavors in that raw fat that's kind of oozing out, you really don't want to pre-cook this sausage. So I like, when it comes to raw sausage, to pinch it flat. If it's in your home oven, if you pinch it the size of a dime, or even a nickel, it's fine. But if you pinch it the size of a quarter, usually it won't cook. You always pinch it flat. Just because it's sausage, you don't want to do sausage balls. You always pinch it flat so it'll cook quicker. I have a Calabrese sausage I sent to them that you're going to try on that. There's a little spiciness to it. I use agave or honey in my Calabrese sausage. We made this two days ago, and I shipped it here next day. Here. Um, you'll taste a little spice when, it, when you have that pizza, and that's with the Calabrian sausage uh, that we do in the restaurant. <laughs> some roasted garlic. I have a kind of a double garlic. I have some roasted. And then we also have some chopped. And it's all about the finishing when it comes to this pizza. You know, when it comes to a pizza, everyone thinks that you need to put everything on at the beginning. Really a lot in the pizza business, more things go on at the end that go on at the beginning. So this pizza has a garlic oil, an oregano, a pecorino romano or parmigiano reggiano, and some piping of ricotta. And really, when it comes all about, you know, when it comes to making pizzas, remember, more sometimes more ingredients go on after. Some people say, "I make a soggy pizza; it, it comes out, you know, wet or weak." A lot of times, is you're just overtopping something you don't want to do, and it's always better to put more on at the end than. than like arugula or parmigiano reggiano or basil or cherry tomato or something like that. Or a finishing cheese like a feta, a goat cheese. Those are all cheeses that don't really need to be cooked. So you have one that you saved for me? Cool. Greatest pizza is here. 
Okay, so I think it came out pretty nice. Bottom's crispy. I'm looking at it in front of me. It's crunchy still. It's been in a box for a little while. So, could you cut this for me and give me a plate? So we're going to cut our pizza before we finish it. And why is that? It's because we're going to have a prettier pizza when we eat it. How's your pizza so far? Is it okay? We have a lot more coming out. Sorry, they'll be bringing it in and bringing it in. So we'll definitely have enough for you guys. Um, I made sure of it because I was back there today when I got off the plane. We came straight here and I wanted to make sure that everything was right. I really want to thank the culinary students in the back. They've been awesome. Punxsutawney, everyone here has been awesome. Scott's been amazing. Um, and I want to forget them. We should give them a round of applause. <laughs> so we have uh, here, we have our Parmigiano Reggiano, some dry oregano, a little bit of garlic oil, and I use a lot of finishing oils a lot. I like to add oil on the top of my pizza when it's done, um, depending on what style. So when you think of a ricotta, it doesn't need to be finished. I mean, it doesn't need to be cooked. And when you think of ricotta and you think of a cannoli, you ever had a cannoli before? It's never cooked. Um, yeah, when you look at a New York slice, you know, it looks nice. When I look at a pizza, I want to look to see if there's a gum line. This, we're seeing if did the students cook this correctly. Be super technical. They did. You really want to see these open pockets here. That means that whoever is in the back making this was nice and light on the dough. This isn't a thin crust. I told them I don't want it thin. I want it to look. I don't want it to look perfect. It should look. It shouldn't look perfect. But if you typically when you have a pizza and you throw it in the oven. Have you ever heard of pizza stone before? Yeah. Pizza stone for pizza. Well, the new pizza stone is pizza steel. So pizza steels are the new thing. Uh, instead of two stone, you have two steels. Your recovery time is way faster, meaning that I put a pizza in, I take it out. It took five minutes. I put a pizza in, I take it out. It's five minutes, 16 seconds. I put a pizza in, I put it back, take it out, put it back, a new one in, and it's like six minutes, and it's seven minutes. Well, these recover really fast if you get multiple pizzas. These get really hot. These cook your bottom great. When you're cooking pizzas at home, do we buy one stone? We always do. We should buy two or buy two steels because in an oven, you have two, at least two shells that you put it in. I want to start my pizza on the upper shelf. Then when it's 80% done, take it down and finish it on the bottom or 70%. In the pizza business, when we put a pizza in the oven, if it's a gas brick oven, like a stone oven, we put a pizza in the oven and we cook it as long as we can, and then we look at the bottom, we put it in a hot spot. In your home oven, when you only have one spot, you never have a hot spot. So you really should invest in two stones or two steels so you have that hot spot you could put that pizza in and get a really nice, get a really nice bottom. This, they cooked it right. They put it in the oven, they cooked it in that oven, and I taught them, I said, look at the bottom. If it looks finished on top, just hey, put it in a hot spot, uh, an area where there's no pizza at. Does that make sense? You can do that in your home oven by having two stones, here and then finish here. If you cook it in the hot sp uh, spot long enough and you're not moving it around the oven in a, in a commercial oven all the time, your bottom's gonna be done before your middle. This person didn't do that. They cooked it perfectly. Scott couldn't have cooked it more better than this. <laughs> um, I mean, but um, there's starter in this. There's 20% starter in this. This is a 10 pound batch, two pounds of starter, salt, yeast. It's really the same. The uh, master dough with starter in that book is pretty much this. And this is with my flour that I shipped here like two weeks ago. Um, but I hope you enjoy this. Uh, it's a great pizza. It's a New Yorker. It's a pizza that won in Las Vegas for best pizza in the world. Uh, my chef, Tiago, uh, competed with it. It was kind of my pizza that he competed with, but he still uh, did his own little tweaks to it. And um, yeah, I'm glad I'm able to share that with you guys. So,
have any questions real quick before we move on? Any questions at all? You mentioned that you shipped your flour here. What, what's special about your flour? I have a double zero flour. Has anyone ever heard of a double zero flour? Any cooties out there? What's double zero? You hear it a lot. It's European. It's Italian. It uh, means a type of refinement. When wheat gets picked, gets sent to a mill, the mill says, I'll take it. They clean it, they put it through a humidifier, they take the outside of the grain, take the bottom of the grain, they start to grind it, they start to sift it. And at these mills, the more they sift it, the more refined it is. So double zero is a type of refinement. Zero is the second, um, one, two, and then a whole meal. There's five different types of refinement. In the pizza business and in Italy, we typically use double zero or zero flours ones that are really refined. So I have a double zero flour um, that a company called Central Milling makes. They, um, they produce a lot of bakers, a lot of flours for bakeries. Um, it's a flour that took me about two and a half years to come up with and it uh, kind of resembles a flour that's called power flour. <laughs> um, power, power flour that um, is uh, popular in the industry. It, it's a little like another flower called all trumps. Um, you get a nice crumb. Remember, we want old dough. When I make you dough, do I want to feed it to you in an hour? Do I want to feed you dough that I made in five hours? Do I want to feed it in 24 hours? When I make dough, yeast feeds on simple sugars and it rises. So when I have a dough ball here and the next day it's here, Yeast will feed on simple sugars and it'll gas up. So if I have a six hour old dough, a 12 hour old dough, a 24 hour old dough, the 24 hour old dough has less simple sugar than the six hour old dough, right? Because yeast eats simple sugar. The longer you let your yeast eat, the less simple sugar that will be in that dough. Hence, if I give you a six hour dough, you wouldn't feel that great. I give you a 36 hour dough, you would feel like a champ because your body has less to process when you eat it. So one of the rule of thumbs in the pizza industry is never eat new dough. It's the worst thing to do. It doesn't digest well. And digestibility is a big part of, pretty much a big part of pizza in Italy. You always hear digestibility. It's making sure you're not, you let your dough mature properly. So the other rule of thumb is don't put cold dough in a hot oven. In the back, when the students were make, made it a couple days ago, we said it didn't turn out as well as we thought. We talked a little bit, and one of the things that they were doing was they were putting cold dough in a hot oven. We always want to stage our dough out, bring it up to room temp for an hour or two, and then put it in. You put cold dough in a hot oven, the bottom scorches, and the middle is weak and, and not cooked. So you don't want a, a dough to come in and, and get scorched. So I need a volunteer. <laughs> we want two volunteers? Okay, maybe I'll get two volunteers. The guy is saying me, 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 or him, him, him. What are you saying? Look here.
on the count of three, we're going to go one, two, three, and then count to three. One, two, three, we'll, and we'll catch it, okay? Ready? And top of the palm, catch with our fist. One, two, three. Nice. So let's do it again. One, two, three. Don't drop it on her. Uh, palm, two fists. Good, she's doing good. <laughs> Not bad. I'm going with my left now. You don't have to go to very soon. Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> okay, I'll show you. Put it in your right hand. You go to your left. Put it in your right hand. We'll go to our left. Go to our right. Go across the shoulders. <laughs> challenge you had to do, and it was a world record already from a guy in Paris that did it in 1990s. Uh, it, was a, it was a size that was, I thought it was impossible. So I didn't focus on that, I focused on best pizza, which was important to me, and in my career I was really focusing on cooking. Um, so first competition, it was highest toss. I come in second, Joe Carlucci from New York wins that, gets a world record, and gets 20 points. Second competition was most rolls, uh, rolls across your shoulders in 30 seconds. I win that. Uh, I get a world record. We uh, we tied. We're 20 and 20 points. The next competition was cooking, and uh, I won with a pizza called the Calatalia, which I'm going to make today. You had to make a pizza in 20 minutes, and you couldn't use the top 10 ingredients that go on a pizza. Um, so you couldn't use pepperoni, you couldn't use chicken, you couldn't use pineapple at the time, onions, bell pepper. So I did a uh, four cheese pizza with imported gorgonzola, asiago, parmigiano reggiano, and uh, mozzarella with uh, three ingredients, fig reduction, a prosciutto, and a balsamic reduction. So you had a fig compote, and then uh, you had sweet, spicy, uh, I'm sorry, sweet, salty, savory, um, acidic, acidity to it. Um, so that's the one I went for, and that was something my grandpa, I, I had a tree for it in a in, in our fig trees. We had three giant fig trees that were as big as a house at our farm. My grandpa was always eating some horrible cheese when I was a kid. It was so strong that I hated it. And he had fig with it, of course, it was sweet. And then he had prosciutto or something salty with it. So I kind of thought of this pizza and I said, oh, I'll try and make something like that. So I ended up winning that for best pizza and I got 18.5 points out of 20, so which I didn't know. So the next competition was the biggest pizza in the world, and that's the one that was impossible to break. You get 20 points if you, whoever wins that, and then uh, whoever happened to break the existing world record would get an additional 20. 
that means that whoever won that would get 40 if they and if they broke the record. Uh, anybody can win. So Siler Chapman comes up and um, breaks the world record. He's from uh, he's from uh, South Carolina and he breaks the world record by two inches. It's like he does 31 inches. Mike Shepard comes up and he breaks the world record, Siler's world record in two minutes. It's like the fastest world record broken. And he breaks it with like 31 and a half inches or something. I go up and break, beat Michael Shepard's record and I get 32 and something inches. And then now it's New York, Joe Carlucci. Two minutes left. Yeah, you know, win the ten thousand dollar prize. Win, you know, everything. Get the Guinness record. And the Joe Lock signage. Love to see him. I see him a lot. He lost by an inch. He hates me. No. <laughs> I'm gonna see Joe next week. I'm gonna be in Columbus. I'm for Punxsutawney, Pittsburgh, Akron, Columbus. That's where I'm gonna be you know, for the next six to seven days. I wanna be in a car with Scott Anthony. <laughs> which just could be finished. It's a semi-soft cheese, and it could be finished with it, or it can be cooked. On the competition, I cook with it. It could go underneath your mozzarella if you want, if you're worried about it. Turning brown, because, you know, it will turn slightly brown or start to slightly burn a little more than this 100% whole mozzarella. We have an imported gorgonzola that we're going to cook, and this is a white pizza. You know, it's three cheeses now. When it comes out, I'm going to finish it with the other ingredients. White pizzas always hold up better in your home ovens. And um, yeah, this one, uh, this is a great pizza. You'll love it. And we're going to serve it second today because it's just a better pizza because it's sweeter. It's always better than the sweet, of course, towards the end. Uh, we're going to cook that. If I was using my home oven or your home oven, I'd have my oven cranked up to five. 500 to 525. Start it on my upper shelf on my stone or steel. Cook it halfway to 75%, then finish it on the bottom. And then you have a um, you have a calatayo. Okay, it's coming. Okay, it's coming. All right, so we have some New Yorker. If anybody wants some, more New Yorker. Or how was that pizza, okay? Do we have any questions about anything? Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry I didn't take it. I think these bread flour, depends, what do you cook in? Do you cook home oven? Yeah. Bread flour works good. High gluten, high protein works the best in your life. If I'm cooking in a wood fire oven, 700 to 1,000, I would go for a red flour that's lower in protein. It'll cook better. Yeah, so it, it depends on temperature. And, you know, if you did Sir Lancelot, maybe the uh, King Arthur would work better than King Arthur. It's higher protein. Do you have, like, preference when it comes to yeast? Yeah, so when it comes to yeast, I'm more of a fan of a fresh yeast or a dry acne yeast. I'm not a fan of quick, like sap or like quick rising yeast. Um, me, I always want to use older dough, so I'm not trying to hurry my dough. I don't want to use it six hours or eight hours, even if I'm using a, a, a quick rise yeast. For me, I really want to use a yeast that's slower, like an active dry or a fresh yeast. I mean, the same thing, fresh yeast and active dry yeast, like Red Star, if you're looking at it, or Fleischmann. I mean, I like Fleischmann's when it comes to a fresh block, and I like Red Star when it comes to an active dry. Fresh and active dry are the same. Active dry is three times stronger than fresh. It's the same strand. Um, starters, though, I talked about that earlier. I like to use starters in all my dough. Starters are really for the flavor and complexity, but it doesn't, it's not as important for the rise. That's why uh, you always see in my book, I'll have a little bit of yeast for the rise, and really that complexity comes and the flavor comes from the starter. 
Any other questions? So, uh, when you're making the white pizza, do you put, um, Go ahead. Do you put like, any oil or anything down there? I didn't put any oil on this one. I could on other whites. This one, I don't want the flavor profile to go. I'm looking for that gorgonzola, the prosciutto, um, the balsamic reduction. Um, I'm kind of looking for those key elements in it. Not so much like uh, a white pie with tomatoes and basil. I would put garlic oil or oil over it. If I put a spinach ricotta pizza in the white pie, I would put olive oil over it. But I'm not looking for that flavor in the oil in this pizza. I'm really looking for those three key greens. Um, you have an elderly woman over there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Say it one more time. Yeah, I like to use small. So um, in Italy, when I went to Italy, I was making pizza for 14 years, and I went to Italy, and I got certified, and I, I run a school. I certify 70 chefs a year out of uh, a program I have. It's the International School of Pizza I have in North Beach, in uh, Little Italy, San Francisco. Um, I had a pizzeria with my brother for years, and I went to Italy, and uh, it was kind of all the, um, <coughs> a lot of the whys, you know, why didn't my dough rise? Why didn't my dough blow up? Why didn't it brown? And, Kind of the whys in the industry, they were all answered at this school. It was the chemistry behind dough. <coughs> and I was used to using sugar, typically, um, and then they were using malt, the derivative of barley. It was more of a natural product. And I like the flavor of it. I like how my dough uh, round. I like how my dough ro rose from it. Um, I liked everything about it. So it's another kind of, I guess you could say it's a pretty, like a secret of the industry that you don't see powdered malt that often. I learned that a lot from cooking in Italy. Um, and uh, there's a, to get too technical, but there's different types of malts, and I use one that's called low diastatic malt. Diastatic, it's, it, it helps the complex sugars in your flour break down into simple sugars. Uh, so it, it assists in two things, the breaking down of complex and the simple, and it also helps the brown. So I, I, I talk about a low diastatic um, and you're seeing, you see bakers use it more, you don't see pizza operators use it as much. Um, yeah, I like it a lot. Um, you've done Tony and the Champions, and you've also done pizza as well. Why the pizza Bible now? Yeah, I think I talked a little bit about that earlier. I, I think a lot of it had to do with the regional styles that I learned, um, and also the references now to what books were. Back in the day, like I said, 10 years ago when I did pizza, it, the references, you know, I want to talk about grande cheese, I want to talk about all trumps, and you know, you get a book, they send it, they give it to three people, the three people do recipes, this is testing. Three people go to the grocery store, well, they back in the day, well, couldn't find sea salt. You don't know what flour you're talking about, you know, nobody knew what you're talking about, and how do they get it? So why talk about it to the consumer when they can't get it? So when you talk about my first book to what it is now, now you can get it. Now you can Google it, you can do anything to it. Um, now you can get anything online and you can get uh, use the web. And from what books were back in the day to what they are now, um, I was able to pretty much put what I wanted in this book. And it was, it was, it was really important because we don't, we don't use your everyday products that you find in grocery stores. We just don't. And, and a lot of it has to do with the ingredients. You think about your farmer's markets, there's so many ingredients you buy in produce, it has to do with your basic ingredients, um, like your pre-ferments and flours and stuff like that. So, yeah. I learned a lot, uh, the, you know, from what I knew 10 years ago or what I knew 23 years ago to what I knew now, it's, um, it's changed quite a bit. You're always trying to make it better. Something that I always say is, you know, I won this world title in Italy, it's a, was a one for best pizza in the world in Naples. First time anybody outside of Naples ever won. I was escorted out by security. When I got, you know, when we got announced, you saw, you know, the police come to me and just say, "Don't get excited." And the American table had to get escorted out of the arena when I won this. So I'm here on the stage holding this cup. I can't get excited. I'm excited a little bit, but I can't really get thoroughly excited. Um, and I um, said to myself, you know, how do you make it better? I'm always trying to refine things. I'm always trying to, you know, make it better. I'm always going back in the kitchens and saying, hey, what if we added a, a little more water and do this and do that? 
I'm not really taking anything out of what I did before, but you know, that winning pizza was awesome, but is my winning pizza better than it was from 07 to what it is today in my Tony Pizza in San Francisco? It's better. Yeah, and, and people think I'm nuts because I remember Glenn Stabalski and a couple other guys were in the industry after I won. They were celebrating, we were hanging out at the hotel, and they were saying, good job, guy. And I'm like, no, I, I think I'm gonna, I can make this better. And Glenn looked at me like, you just won the whole thing. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, you know, and then my wife said, that's the way he is. He's, you know, always trying to, my wife knows how I am. Um, so yeah, I always say, and I think that's, that's when we become better. And uh, whenever we think we're the best, I think that's when we lose. So I kind of keep that in my head. Um, so the uh, Calatalia is coming out. Um, a little weaker, this one. A little softer, huh? Than the other pie. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, just, just to kind of say, different baker. Over top, maybe a little too much cheese. Maybe. Just looking at it, because the other pie had more ingredients on it. And I'm super technical. I, you know, always judging myself, but when I look at it, I think that, okay, maybe it was a little over top. Bottom's not bad. It could have been cooked a little longer. Um, it's in a box. It couldn't, we know it wasn't in a big box that long, but, you know, you're always trying to figure out how to make it a little better. Too much cheese. Could have been cooked for another two minutes. It would have came out just like that New Yorker. Um, So we have this fig preserve. Um, you know, you can cook down your mission figs in the summer if you get them around here. I don't, I don't know if you do. If you didn't, one of the best fig preserves that I love is called uh, Dalmatia. It's a company called, it's from Croatia. That's the one I use on the Food Network. Um, in the summer, sometimes you'll see me using uh, just regular figs with a little bit of uh, balsamic already on them. We have some prosciutto da Parma. Prosciutto is aged two years, sliced pretty thin. I'm going to try to put a piece on each slice for you. You can have sh shaved Parmigiano Reggiano or, or um, grated. I like to shave a little bit. Um, yeah, that's the, um, can you see that in the bottom at all, or no? Yeah, we'll see that now. Well, that's the dog eye. Pretty nice, you'll like this one. Can I pass this out to some people? Who didn't get the cow tie <laughs> You like Gorgonzola? You don't know? <laughs> don't be mad at me if you don't like it. <laughs> Just kind of hold it up. Balsamic reduction. We have a five year uh, from Modena uh, balsamic that we just produced. And then it, you know, it sweetens it a little bit, it's not too acidic. Who wants to try this one? Favorite pizza. What's my favorite pizza? It's like asking a father who's my favorite son. 
can't say it. You know, I, I, I like them all. That's why, you know, at Tony's, we have seven ovens, 13 styles of pizza. We do every style of pizza at Tony's. It's one of the only three in the whole world. That, it is the only pizza in the whole world that you can get every style. Of. Other than I have a Chicago place down the street that has all the Chicago pizza. Which one? Are you ready? Spaghetti and meatballs, or spaghetti, sorry, with meat sauce was my mom's favorite. She made this dish called enchilada casserole. Uh, my mother was uh, Spanish, uh, so I'm Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish, and my mom made this enchilada casserole. And then taquitos, uh, she would uh, eat all day and be full of part and make taquitos all day. Like the best, but she made the best growing up. Um, yeah, but her spaghetti and meat sauce is very simple. So, what's my experience on making uh, gluten free pizza? So what's interesting is, you know, all the binding agents that are in dough tend not to be in uh, gluten-free pizza. You know, the two proteins, the gliadine and glutenine, really makes gluten. When you take those out, you have dough that's just brittle. So I have one that I like. Um, you guys want to write this down. This is a combination of tapioca flour and rice flour. It's a 60-40, 40% rice. Uh, sorry, 60% rice, 40% uh, tapioca. And then I have some binding agents like a xanthan gum, a lot of potato starch, uh, my salt, my yeast. The three ingredients I have in mind that in my gluten-free that tend not to be in a lot of gluten-free. One is agave nectar, which sweetens it. Um, and it also helps it bind together because it's, it's sticky. Um, the other thing is rosemary and thyme, which I have in mind, which kind of makes it a little more flavorful because a lot of times when you have gluten-free dough, it's not very flavorful. And I like egg whites in mind to fluff it. Um, typically you have them, they're really, really thin. And if you add egg whites to it, it'll help fluff it a little bit and give it some rise because you tend not to see, gluten-free has no gluten net to allow the dough to expand. The gas gets released. So it's really hard to really capture any of that flavor. And hence, you typically don't have a rise. The egg whites will help it. You know, you see some like Thomas Keller, Chef Keller, like has cup for cup. It's a pretty good um, blend if you wanted to research and get it. It has a lot of binding agents, a lot of starches in it, but you kind of need a lot of starch in it. No, no, your rice flour, are you using straight white or a combination of rices? Um, I use a straight white, yeah. But you can use a combination if you want to do it. If you want the Bob's Mill, Bob's Red Mill, and did a search, you wanted to find some good combinations of, you know, rice. You could, you could, uh, you could find the potato starch. He makes all of them. I don't know if you've heard of Bob's Red Mill. I mean, that's kind of a go-to for a lot of people. I accidentally put things a rice flour blend for a pizza dough. the gummy you know you, you typically put in a pan and you push it out roll it out you're not stretching it out like when you saw me stretch out a dough you're not stretching it you're almost more pushing it down to push it out so you're like compressing it and then shaping it does that make sense you're not trying you're never going to throw it and you're never going to try to um, stretch it you're more pushing it down and out um, it's tricky um, in the industry now, I can get seven companies that have it all pre-blended. Like Caputo has it now. Chico Stagioni has it. Caputo's new. If you're in the industry, Caputo's new flour. If you called Orlando Foods in New Jersey, they are the importer of Caputo in the whole U.S. They um, have Caputo's new. I was just judged their competition in New York. They have a new one out. It's great. I tried it. They made it at the at the competition. It was really good. They added you just add water to it. If I remember right. Just on that, um, one of the first things you mentioned about the stones having two of them. Yeah. So, so I um, didn't quite catch. So you're having one in, and you can't the other one in. You change. Yeah. So you have your oven in front of you, and you have your racks. 
You want to have one on the upper, one on the lower. Have a stone, both of them, stone and stone, or steel and steel, whatever you want. And um, start your pizza on the upper, finish it on the bottom. Get a pe get a pizza peel, like the, you know, a paddle that you slide it onto, and then you use it to pick it up and then finish it. Just to make that bottom, um, you know, extra crispy. And we always, we always have the issue in our home ovens of not getting a crispy bottom. And that's, that's how you achieve it. And the Quarter inch stone works well. I don't like round ones, I like a square one because you have more room to get it off and when you have a round one, it sometimes falls. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, there are, um, I mentioned one in the book uh, that's a go-to stone. I use steel now, it's not more on the, the steel side, but the thicker the better, usually. You can get tile, unglazed tile too, and you can get bricks and lay them in a uh, quarter inch thick bricks and put them in a sheet pan. You can do a lot of kind of things. You can tile in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like a half a quarter sheet pan that has you know a little bit of lip and just fill it with bricks and a quarter sheet. A quarter inch. What would you rate the number one reason for Um I think the innovative side, um, always being ahead of the game, uh, knowing the trends before they become trends. Um, I've tried to do that. I like to try to be the innovator of that. I, I think I've done that in the industry a little bit. It helps to go to Italy. It helped a lot in traveling. Uh, you know, Detroit style is hot right now. It sounds weird, but the last two world titles in 2012 and 13 in Vegas were to Detroit. Nobody had heard of Detroit style pizza outside of Detroit. Um, it was a trend I saw coming. Neapolitan trend, <coughs> cooking at 900 degrees, 90 seconds, uh, using Neapolitan ingredients. It's trendy now. You know, I kind of got into it early. Um, you know, just loving what you do and not in it. Not so much in it for the money. You know, you want, you're always in something for the money, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's important. But loving what you do and doing it, it's making it so much better. I mean, I fell in love with it early. My brother got me into it, and I just, right, as soon as I made it, I, I loved it. Um, so that inspired me to be better at it and, and just, you know, you treat it like a relationship, you know, you almost see it more than you see your own wife. You're at work and, I, you know, you're with your employees and with chefs and cooks. I mean, you're, you're in the kitchen more than your own family, unfortunately. And you're fortunately not there, like, at dinner time when you want to be there. We're eating when everyone is either sleeping or <laughs> doing something else. So it's, it's those day-to-day -day operations that uh, you got to love what you do and you don't. Know, a lot of hours and you get beat up. What's Detroit style pizza like? It's great. It's a cooked in a Detroit style uh, in a uh, blue steel pan, uh, what they clean wrenches with in Detroit. They put wrenches in to add oil, they put it through high pressure, high heat ovens to melt it off. The guy back in uh, Gus Guerrera in the late 40s, early 50s, decided to make a pizza in this pan. He buttered it, he pushed out the dough like a Sicilian square. Um, this pan would get really, really hot, like a cast iron. The cheese is burnt slightly around the edge. He chiseled it out, added two racing stripes of sauce, and he used a brick cheese, which is common in Wisconsin. Sometimes you'll see it with a white cheddar. That even gives it more of that. You ever have a mac and cheese that's kind of slightly toasted, and you have that residual sour, uh, burnt kind of taste in the back of your mouth that you kind of like? <laughs> it's that residual flavor of that that's in this pizza and you eat it and you want the corners and you want it to, and it's great so um yeah detroit red top you pick that pizza yeah like he has a question he's a little afraid to ask how do you grab a tray correctly <laughs> <laughs> Classic Italian Neapolitan course, uh, and you have to test that thing. Um, or you could do a classic American course. I get operators from everywhere. So literally, I But the chefs, owners, operators, operators that have been doing it for 30 years and want to change.
You know, building a kitchen for tomorrow. You never want, you can become very old very fast in this industry. You know, and you never want to be, you never want to be old in an industry and not be able to adapt. A concept that can't adapt is a dead concept. So a lot of, like everyone, you know, Chipotle-like models are coming up everywhere, and 800 degrees, Blaze, all these, where they make a pizza in front of you. You're a buck Tatani, but you're gonna hear about these, you know, coming soon, or you may have heard about them if you read about them. It's the Chipotle kind of Mexican restaurant you can see now is pizza being made in front of you. Everybody's doing that. There's a hundreds of them, like right now, of not just hundreds, but hundreds of different concepts trying to replicate that. A lot of people are trying to change their kitchens to do this concept, and they can't, you know? And um, so a lot of people are hurting right now, especially the artisan movement, the chef movement. Um, that's hurting right now. So it's, it's a big, big evolution, and it's going really quick, and uh, you can't change, or uh, you need to change, it's hard. So you have to build your kitchen correctly. Can you teach Scott how to make that live cheese? Because that was pretty good. You like that last one? <laughs> course that I had problems with my power in the building. And it's like, I think he did it. He's going to turn off the break. Now what would you say is one of uh, the most difficult things that you experience? Like? Consistency of training is the hardest thing. I have uh, eight restaurants right now going on to 12. We'll be open, 13 will be open in uh, within the next three months. Consistency of hands. Everyone has different hands and showing people technique. There's a lot of bad habits. Sometimes it's better to teach somebody that doesn't have bad habits that's, you know, fresh. Because they have more of an open mind to teach somebody that's been behind the line. Like a saute line. If you teach somebody that your way of sauteing and my way is a lot different. The guy's been doing it for 30 years. It's hard to, when you uh, have that in front of you. I like to choose a team that's not all Barry Bonds. I like to choose a team that's, yeah, you know, a couple big home run hitters. You got guys who can steal base. You got some outfielders. I like to build a team that's not just all all stars. And, you know, you don't see teams win and have you know, just one big all star and a prima donna. I like to build teams and I carry it. Like that. And I look at my, my team as a family and I look at that in all my restaurants and try to hire them. That's the hardest thing. Yeah. Skill too. When you have models that are really like really tough, and you, you need people to do certain things, I have multiple of them. Finding skill in suburbs, wood fired up at 900 degrees. You know, if you go to a place that doesn't have it, well, that's great. But too bad nobody knows how to do it. So if you think about that, it's hard to build a concept in an area that doesn't have it. You're so unique, and unless you're the only guy doing it. How do you find a crew that can carry it? Kind of, we should kind of have an idea of what we're talking about. That's, that's been difficult. Lisa, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. I want to know what, what pizza do you make for you? What's your favorite pizza? Right. You want all those things yeah, here. I, uh, here. What's my favorite pizza? Uh, which I got, I have, that's like one? saying, like, who, you know, what did I say earlier? It's like uh, saying uh, your favorite son. <laughs> <laughs> favorite daughter. Who is your favorite son? <laughs> Who's my favorite son? My oldest. Yeah. <laughs> I just had a baby five months ago. restaurant you have the high heat but you have about a two and a half minute churn rather than having a high heat and trying to get a Neapolitan that's a 15 second churn so you have more time but you still have the, the heat in front of you anybody else Your balsamic glaze? yes did you add anything or did you no it's just balsamic glaze and it could have been slightly reduced a little more actually it was a little wet but it's it's nice should have some acidity to it but some sweetness the fig marries with it, and the fig I like to use, like I said, is Dalmatia fig. That's that's the fig I use. I didn't have that here. 
they took it from me when I was at the airport today. restaurants are in San Francisco. I have a Tony's Pizza Napolitana, a Slice House, and a place called Capo's uh, in North Beach in San Francisco. Sacramento, I have Pizza Rock. Northern California, I have a place called Tony's of North Beach and a Slice House. And then I have uh, Mena Ballpark and AT&T Park in Giant Stadium. And I have a few coming in. Uh, one in Vegas going on four in Vegas coming. A bunch in Vegas. One in Pittsburgh coming soon? Maybe. Maybe in Pittsburgh, yeah. <laughs> Because you were raised with your grandfather on the fields, do you intend to take your children, raise them in the kitchen or Yeah, in the well, field? my son just was born, but yeah, that's, I'm looking at, I want to get a, some land. Yeah. I want them to grow up like that. California has really changed, mm -hmm. obviously, from when, even when I was a kid. But yeah, I want to um, have that hit and have that experience. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's, I think you have, well, you don't have to have it, but I think it's important to grow up. So yeah, that's. My goal in the next five years is to try and buy some land somewhere um, and try and have crops and stuff like that. Good places here. Yeah? <laughs> Do you have any questions for the audience? Because we got some prizes here. Well, sorry about that, Steve. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, sorry. You know, you want to say later all the pizza place. Oh, you ate them? Yeah. Oh, you don't eat them? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for having me come out. The mayor, of course, for inviting me to stop. Did you guys have a chance to try the wine? Okay, yeah. Pretty good? Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it.